Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Herbst. I'm president of American Jewish University in Los Angeles. And today I'd like to welcome you to another MAVEN program, a discussion with Polish ambassador to the United States, Marek Magyarowski, regarding Poland's relations with Ukraine, Russia, Israel, and the United States. It's a pleasure to welcome ambassador to the program today. He had a 20 year career as a journalist. In October of 2015, he began to work for the office of the president of the Republic of Poland and an expert in public diplomacy. In June of 2018, he became ambassador of Poland to Israel and he ended his term in 2021. In November of 2021, he began his service as ambassador to the United States. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Lots to discuss, but I know the audience very much wants to begin with Ukraine. Poland, of course, shares a boundary with Ukraine. You've taken in more than half of the almost 6 million refugees that have fled Ukraine since the war began in February. About 5.6 million Ukrainians have fled. Poland's absorbed more than 3 million of them. You're literally on the front lines. Ambassador, what's your assessment of the situation in Ukraine today? We not only share the boundary, as you said, we also share uh, history and culture and also religious background. And that's why, for example, it was much easier for Poles to absorb those waves of refugees which have arrived in Poland over the last couple of uh, weeks. Before the war, we had approximately 1.5 million Ukrainians living and working in Poland. So there was actually fertile ground for the absorption of uh, more migrants and more refugees from uh, Ukraine. Of course, I wish it had been for different reasons because those Ukrainians who had arrived in Poland much earlier uh, over the last two decades are integrating uh, impeccably smoothly into the Polish society. This is a model of uh, integration and migration we are so uh, proud of. Um, that outpouring of solidarity and sympathy and love towards our Ukrainian brethren uh, came as no surprise for me personally. Maybe it was a surprise for uh, the international community, for our friends and allies in the European Union. Um, the Polish parliament passed a law a few weeks ago, which uh, essentially facilitates uh, further and deeper integration of Ukrainian refugees into the Polish society, into the Polish labor market, uh, so many benefits that we have decided to grant to, uh, to our Ukrainian uh, neighbors. They can set up their own businesses. They can apply for Polish ID. They can send Polish, uh, they can send their children to Polish schools. Uh, they are eligible for health insurance. So almost all benefits that Polish citizens uh, receive nowadays are also available for Ukrainian refugees. Now, uh, more than a million Ukrainian citizens have applied and received Polish IDs. Uh, interestingly, about 94% of them are women and children. That also indicates the uh, scale of the sacrifice of the Ukrainian people, because many of, uh, for example, many of, of the men who lived and worked in Poland returned to Ukraine after the beginning of the hostilities to defend their country. But one thing is pretty clear and uh, crucial in the whole discussion about uh, the Ukrainians uh, fighting for their freedom. They're not fighting only for their freedom. They're fighting for our freedom as well, for our sovereignty. They are defending our values. And that's why so many Poles uh, feel obliged to provide assistance uh, to those uh, refugees. Um, I'm saying this is the very first time, uh, the first period in my own life that I'm proud of two nations simultaneously, of my own and of the Ukrainian people. Ambassador, uh, Poland has to be a close Russia watcher, uh, trying to understand what's going on in Moscow and uh, understanding the evolution of the conflict in Ukraine. What do you think Putin wants? And what was his goal in invading Ukraine? And what do you think uh, 
his eventual goal is. I tend to joke that I know everything about Mr. Putin and what will, what he will do next, and uh, how this war will end. Uh, of course, I don't know anything. Uh, I don't know what scenario he will choose, uh, what we will face within the next two or three weeks on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, the character of this war uh, is changing as we speak. Just a few weeks ago, we saw Kiev being surrounded by Russian troops. Then they withdrew uh, and uh, they are now regrouping their units, moving them to the east. Uh, we don't know, for example, what exactly uh, Putin's plans are and how he can define victory in this war. I think it's absolutely vital. Now, uh, especially on the eve of, the, of uh, May the 9th, the victory parade, which will take place on the Red Square in Moscow. And we are all uh, wondering what uh, the Russian president will announce on that day, whether he will announce ultimate victory in the war against Ukraine, or he will declare officially war on Ukraine, which would allow him to mobilize um, uh, conscripts into the Russian army and to intensify his military efforts, uh, mostly in the East. What the, the question which uh, lurks on the horizon is as follows. What will Putin be satisfied with? And uh, this is, this is pretty, a pretty disturbing question for all of us because uh, he is unpredictable. I've uh, already said on numerous occasions that uh, it's very hard to navigate uh, the Russian president's mind. Um, until recently, I was absolutely convinced that we are dealing with a pragmatic politician who uh, does know what Russia's geopolitical interests are, uh, which are completely contrary to ours, of course. But, uh, uh, if you if you try to look at the world, at, uh, at uh, the contemporary geopolitical situation, uh, in particular in our part of the world, you could uh, you can imagine and you can make a list of priorities for the Russian Federation. So you can try, you can at least try to look at the world uh, from his perspective or from Russia's perspective. Uh, in spite of the fact that, of course, we we usually don't agree with uh, the priorities. Uh, of the Russian political elite nowadays. But now I'm not so sure whether we are dealing with a pragmatic uh, uh, politician. Uh, I, uh, we, we have all heard uh, a few speeches he has delivered over the last couple of weeks, and uh, those were also pretty disturbing uh, from the viewpoint of our collective security in uh, Europe. Uh, his obsession with Ukraine uh, was a, a well-known and well-established fact. Uh, as you can remember, he wrote and published that uh, famous or infamous uh, article uh, on Ukraine, on the future of bilateral relations between Russia and Ukraine, uh, stating quite explicitly that uh, Ukraine is not a nation, it's not even a country, that the Ukrainians and the Russians are uh, basically the same nation. And Pretty paradoxically, uh, in the course of that war, he has proven uh, that Ukrainians and Russians are not the same nation. And some of, of, of the measures he has undertaken, some of the steps he has made over the last uh, uh, eight weeks since the beginning of the war have been uh, so uh, shockingly counterproductive. Uh, from the point of view of Russia's geopolitical interests. He has not only proven that Russians and Ukrainians are not the same people, he has also strengthened the, the Ukrainian national identity. He has uh, uh, reinvigorated the European Union, especially the European Union's foreign policy. He has pushed Sweden and Finland closer towards NATO. So if NATO uh, absorbs Sweden and Finland, and I keep my fingers crossed for these two countries uh, to join uh, this organization shortly, it would be a, a, a masterful move. Uh, and we would, uh, we would have to uh, praise Putin for, for that, for enlarging NATO, something he has always feared. 
in uh, what he has always stressed as one of the, of the uh, existential threats which Russia, Russia has been facing uh, since the first wave of enlargement in 1999. So um, it's, if you ask me what uh, uh, Mr. Putin's next moves will be, I don't have that much hubris to answer that question. Ambassador, are you satisfied with the response of the West led by the United States since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in late February? It depends uh, on how we define West. Uh, in Poland, in, in uh, ongoing discussions about uh, what is uh, uh, occurring right now in Ukraine, we usually use the term, we have, um, uh, we have been using this term again, uh, the free world, because it's not only the West. Japan and South Korea are not in the West, and Japan and South Korea joined that common effort, for example, to impose economic sanctions on, uh, on uh, Russia. So it's not only the West, it's a free world. And we have uh, been facing, we have been witnessing kind of a recreation of the Cold War scenario and the Cold War chessboard, if you will, uh, which is also um, discomforting from uh, our perspective as well, because we, we wouldn't like to repeat the same scenario again after you know more than 30 years after the collapse of the berlin wall and after the, the fall of um, communism but my impression is that uh, the russian president wants to win the cold war not the new one he wants to win the old cold war which ended in well roughly in, at the beginning of the of the 90s with the breakup of the uh, soviet union he still feels humiliated. No wonder that he once famously used that term and he said that uh, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest calamity in the, 20, in the 20th uh, century. Those are his exact words. So he still feels humiliated as uh, does the Russian society. But again, we have to uh, highlight that uh, enormous effort of Mr. Putin put into brainwash his own society. It, it has been um, approximately 22 years of indoctrination and of uh, convincing his uh, fellow countrymen that uh, Russia, the Soviet Union first, and then Russia, are constantly humiliated by the West. They are encircled by NATO. That they are, uh, that the Russian society, the Russian people are, um, still engaged, involved in a clash of civilizations between the West, which is decadent, uh, spoiled and weak, and the grandiose idea of, uh, uh, of contemporary Russia, which has inherited, of course, uh, the grandeur of uh, the Soviet Union. Looking to the future, um, and to borrow a famous quote from uh, one of America's wars, how does this end? Uh, would you favor uh, Ukraine joining either or both of the EU and NATO? These two organizations are symbolic uh, of uh, our path, Poland's um, aspirations and ambitions. Uh, as I said a few minutes ago, we joined NATO in 1999 uh, five years afterward, we uh, entered the European Union, which were two uh, crucial steps in our political and economic uh, progress and development. Uh, that's why we, are, we now feel secure. That's why we now feel uh, surrounded by uh, allies and friends. Um, that's why we don't fear a hypothetical confrontation with Russia. Now let's try to imagine what would have happened if we hadn't joined NATO in 1999, if the Czech Republic and Hungary uh, hadn't joined that organization at the time. What if uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and the Baltics were not members of NATO today? Where would Putin stop in, um, under these circumstances? 
So those are the, the, the vital questions we have been asking ourselves since the beginning of that war. And again, uh, Poland, uh, as you said, has always been a very, um, a very keen watcher of uh, political developments in Russia, first in the Soviet Union, and then in, in, in Russia, and also in Ukraine and in Belarus. And we have always been, well, maybe not always, but uh, uh, on most occasions, we were pressured. And for example, when we talk about just a brief digression. When you talk about energy security, we thought about uh, rendering Poland independent of uh, imports of Russian gas and other commodities uh, many years ago, decades ago, actually. And quite miraculously, we are going to be entirely independent of imports of Russian gas by October this year, because we are not going to renew that long-term contract with Gazprom. We, uh, uh, the Baltic pipeline, which will deliver gas from Norway via Denmark to the Polish stretch of the Baltic coast will be operational uh, this autumn. And this is quite an achievement, especially when you look at other countries which were not so uh, uh, pressured. We have been so adamant that it was one of our priorities uh, in terms of our geopolitical uh, attitude towards Russia. So uh, there are so many elements and vectors which uh, have uh, guided us towards the, uh, you know, this, this situation we find ourselves in right now. Ambassador, we can return to many issues in regarding European uh, security architecture in Ukraine in a few minutes. I do wanna talk for a few minutes about your time as ambassador to Israel which was a particularly fraught uh, period, not due to you, uh, but was a particularly fraught period uh, relations between Israel and Poland. Uh, you came uh, in 2018, just about at that time, Poland passed a law which made it illegal to accuse the Polish nation of complicity in the Holocaust. That law, after significant complaints by Israel, the United States and others, was revised, then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it an attempt to rewrite history. Uh, and eventually Poland and Israel issued a joint declaration, um, which didn't satisfy everyone, including Yad Vashem, which uh, uh, criticized the joint announcement. Why this effort now uh, at an official governmental level uh, to address the historiography of the Holocaust. What, what was the aim uh, from Poland's point of view and why do you think it went, it roiled relations so much? For many years, we had to go with an unfair depiction of Poland as a, a country which uh, had something to hide during the war and during the Holocaust. And that's why, for example, we were reacting pretty harshly and, and rightly to all those uh, uh, definitions of uh, the so-called Polish death camps. We were absolutely frustrated by that uh, flood of uh, uh, passages in international media, uh, op-eds, uh, commentaries, uh, written by authors who were indiscriminately using that uh, uh, absurd term. So I myself had to explain to my interlocutors in, in so many countries in so many media outlets that it was uh, for us uh, absolutely stunning, bewildering to, uh, you know, to, to come across this kind of uh, uh, characterization of Poland's role during the Holocaust only through this one absurd uh, term, Polish death camps. I, I don't need to remind you that also one of the American presidents used it on an official uh, occasion, which was, uh, doubly disquieting from our uh, perspective. So, uh, and then uh, of course we had to react also legally because it was no other way to, uh, to counter this kind of narrative. I'm not going to go into detail and uh, pass the uh, provisions of that amendment which was passed at the time by the Polish parliament. I will just tell you one anecdote, uh, not funny, a very sad one. Um, uh, a, a history, uh, well, so many uh, episodes in our common history 
which uh, uh, come to my mind when I talk about the Holocaust and uh, the, the, the Polish national's attitude towards Jews uh, in that time. You, you all perfectly know that uh, uh, there are um, uh, approximately 7,000 Poles among the righteous among, uh, among the nations uh, who have been honored by Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. There is one particular story about uh, four Polish families in two villages in central Poland, started Czepielów and Rakówka. Don't even try to spell those names. Uh, in uh, 1942, if my memory doesn't fail me, uh, during the war, an um, SS unit showed up in one of those villages. They, uh, they knew that there were Jews hiding in those uh, villages. Uh, and they knew which families were trying to rescue them, four families. They rounded up uh, all of them, 31 people. They executed them on the spot. They murdered them uh, on the main square of that one village. Uh, there were also children aged uh, like 16, 18 months. Uh, they set all their houses ablaze. They tossed those children into the flames. Uh, they murdered the rest of uh, those families. 31 people, 30, 31 Polish uh, nationals. Now, how many Jews were hiding in those villages? A couple, two Jews. The Germans murdered 31 Polish nationals who were trying to help those Jews, they're trying to rescue those Jews from uh, extermination. Now, there was no internet at the time, of course, but you can imagine that everybody in the adjacent villages in a radius of, I don't know how many miles, maybe 20, 30, 50, knew very well what happened in those villages and why, why those people were murdered. Do you think that those people who lived in the, in the neighborhood, they were, eager to help Jews who are seeking help, who are knocking on their doors, were they embraced with open arms by those Polish neighbors? Of course not, because they were trying to save their own families. They were not opening their doors, they were closing their windows. They were not very enthusiastic about helping and rescuing Jews. Now, in all those discussions today about how we behaved during the war, we tend to forget these nuances, the social background, the political background, the background of the German occupation. So uh, if you try now to blame those people for turning their backs on Jews, on the Jewish brethren, you must not forget those nuances and those little details which uh, indicate that it was not so easy, it was not so uh, black and white. Uh, I have already told that, uh, that story so many times, also in Israel. And believe me, there was always, always a, a 10 second silence after I concluded my uh, speech because it's so shocking to understand what really happened in Poland uh, during the war. People were executed for handing a loaf of bread uh, to Jews who were rounded up, for example, in, in Warsaw in other cities and deported to, to concentration camps. Um, I'm telling this just to you know, shed some light on, uh, on those particular circumstances uh, millions of Poles and millions of Jews had to live under during the war and uh, during the Holocaust. Ambassador, as I said, you had a particularly fraught time when you were ambassador to Israel. In July 2021, Poland's legislature passed a law which effectively cut off any further restitution to the heirs of property seized by Nazis during the Holocaust. In response, Israel's foreign minister Lapid called it anti-Semitic and immoral. Poland responded by accusing Israel of baseless and irresponsible behavior. 
and countries recalled their respective ambassadors, including yourself, of course. Um, I guess the same question, why, why this law now? Uh, and uh, um, how do you respond to the concerns of the successor government to uh, Netanyahu, uh, which uh, nonetheless seems to have also had considerable problems with your government? Uh, first of all, I, I also explained that uh, particular issue on uh, multiple occasions, both in Israel and here in the United States, and also in Poland. It's also a complex issue, as you can imagine. We are talking about property lost in the whirlwind of, uh, of the war and uh, after communists came uh, to power in, in Poland uh, after 1945. And again, uh, if you look, for example, at, at pictures images of Warsaw in 1945. It was uh, uh, a city which was razed by Germans. Uh, there was no property, actually, just bricks and dust. And uh, I was all, all also telling a story of, um, of one building in Warsaw uh, in which uh, five or six families lived before the war. And they lost it during the war. And uh, they were, one of those families was Jewish and those Jews were deported to a concentration camp. Uh, their descendants survived the Holocaust, but then they came back to also no documentation, no papers, no certificates. Those families who lived in that uh, particular building also perished. So many Poles were also annihilated, exterminated during the war many of them also in concentration camps. So all those families who had lived in that building before the war didn't live there after the war. There were new families, new tenants, new owners. Many of those uh, documents which were supposed to prove their ownership were forged, um, lost in, uh, during the war as well. Uh, so it was very difficult and it still is to prove ownership of, of uh, property, not only in Warsaw, also in other uh, cities. Then when we regained independence in 1989, uh, many people were trying to cement, so to speak, their right and their ownership of some of those uh, buildings. Many Jewish families claimed their own uh, rights and their ownership of those uh, buildings and uh, other kinds of property. Uh, a, a total legal mess. You can't even imagine uh, what the Polish state authorities and the Polish municipalities had to cope with. Uh, many people who lived in those buildings, which belonged to someone else before the war and after the war, were afraid of losing that property. Uh, so we had to cut it, ultimately. We had to sort it out. We had to find a solution, not only to satisfy the claims of uh, many Jewish families, but also of Polish families who had lost their property uh, during the war and after the war under communist rule. A very complex issue and uh, it's, it's not exactly true that it is, it is no longer possible for the descendants of Jewish families who lived in Warsaw and in other Polish cities to claim property. It's still, uh, it is still possible uh, for them to regain the property lost during and after uh, the war. And again, um, when you look at our um, shared history and common past, uh, during my stint in Israel, I never concealed the, the darkest chapters of our history. Uh, I spoke openly about uh, anti-Semitism, about pogroms, about lost property. But also I was trying to uh, explain, again, all those nuances of, of, those, uh, of that complex uh, common history and bilateral, bilateral relationship of Jews and Poles. Ambassador, several members of the audience have asked a question uh, about how do you assess the current level of anti-Semitism, open or subtle, in Poland? Um, 
Deborah Lipstadt once said, uh, when, it, when she was traveling around Europe, and she wrote, I think she wrote it in one of her books, that uh, when she is in uh, uh, Paris or in Rome in, or in some other European capitals, she doesn't need to ask where the nearest synagogue is, because when she, when she sees an armed guard in front of a building, she already knows there is a synagogue behind that armed guard, usually armed with a long rifle. Uh, in Poland, we don't need armed guards in front of our synagogues. This is also an, uh, an indication of uh, uh, the level of anti-Semitism in Poland and in other European countries. I'm not saying that we are immune to uh, anti-Semitism in Poland. Uh, there have been incidents when uh, I'm an active user of Twitter and other social media, so I can see, you know, uh, up close what is going on there. Uh, there is anti-Semitism in Poland, as there is anti-Semitism in France and Italy, in uh, Germany, in Austria, in almost all European countries. And I'm very uh, angry when I hear all those uh, uh, weird and disturbing comments, uh, mostly coming from the, you know, uh, from the far right, for example, which is, by the way, pretty pretty weak in in uh, Poland. Uh, but um, if you compare the level of anti-Semitism in Poland and in other countries, uh, and if you talk to to Jews, Israelis who visit Poland on a regular basis, uh, I believe that they feel much more secure in Warsaw, in Krakow, in Gdańsk, in Poznan, than in many other European uh, capitals. Again, uh, it is a problem, it is an issue we have had to cope with for uh, many years. And I'm committed uh, as, a, as a former Polish uh, ambassador to Israel and as a friend of Israel and a friend of uh, Jews and Jewish culture that, uh, to uh, defending uh, the Jews' right to have their own state, the Jews' right to have their own culture, and I'm really, um, I, I find all those um, instances of anti-Semitism, not only in Poland, but also in other European countries, absolutely abhorrent. But again, uh, I think that uh, there are countries uh, which have um, a, a much more serious problem with anti-Semitism nowadays than Poland. Ambassador, another question from the audience. Do you think that the refugees who have fled Ukraine will be able to return at some point? Or are you uh, assuming that the several million who have come over the border are now going to be part of your country? They are most welcome. As I said, uh, it's now, um, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's about seven to 8% of our uh, population. Uh, they are integrating uh, remarkably well into the Polish society. Many of them uh, chose to stay in Poland because they believe, they hope that the war will uh, end soon and that they will be able to return to their homes in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in Lviv, even in Mariupol. Uh, I'm not that terribly optimistic. I believe it will be a protracted war. And uh, of course we have already taken in more than 3.1 million refugees. Uh, this is probably the first uh, humanitarian crisis of this magnitude in Europe's history in which the host country doesn't need to build refugee camps. We have not. We have, we have uh, had some uh, five or six congressional delegations from the United States in recent weeks, and uh, uh, some of those American congressmen and senators were asking their counterparts uh, in, in Poland, where are the refugee camps? We would like to visit one, but uh, there are none because uh, an overwhelming majority of those Ukrainian refugees are being hosted by Polish families in their private homes. Some of them re-emigrated to other countries, to Germany, to France, to, uh, to uh, Denmark or to Sweden, but uh, most of them uh, stayed in Poland. Poland is filling up, of course. It's, uh, we have to be pragmatic 
and realistic about Poland's ability, ability to absorb more migrants, more refugees from, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, we need assistance. We are in talks with the European Commission uh, in order to, uh, uh, to ease up on that uh, tension, which is quite natural and understandable. But again, uh, the Ukrainians are most welcome. We are, I once said, we are doing for Ukraine what uh, many other countries and nations did not do for Poland in 1939. And I believe, unfortunately, that we are now facing another 1939 moment in Europe's history. Ambassador, on that point, another member of the audience asks, do you believe that the rest of the world will eventually have to send their own armies into Ukraine, uh, as opposed to the current posture of sending weaponry to Ukraine for them to fight for themselves? It's one of the most difficult uh, and troubling questions we are asking ourselves, because of course, uh, nobody needs a direct military confrontation with a nuclear superpower. And Russia is a nuclear superpower, and uh, uh, Ukraine is not uh, a NATO member. So technically, we are not obliged to defend Ukraine militarily, but we can use all other means to help Ukrainians defend themselves and uh, defeat the Russian aggressor. And uh, we are doing our utmost. Poland, the United States, uh, the UK, and other allies to deliver weapons to Ukraine. Uh, I don't think we are going to, uh, to send our troops into that country unless Russia uh, chooses to attack one of uh, NATO members, be it Poland, uh, or Baltics, or Romania. Uh, Russia is now, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, we, nobody knows what Putin's ultimate goals are. Uh, I have read uh, numerous reports about Putin's intention to attack Moldova, for example. Moldova is not a NATO member state either. So this creates a serious an array of problems for the, for, for the free world, how to react to uh, Russia's aggression and to Russia's acts of barbarism in Ukraine and to Russia's growing neo-imperial ambitions. I think we are doing the right thing right now uh, arming Ukraine and uh, trying to prevent uh, a spillover of that conflict to, to the rest of Europe and especially to Central Europe. Ambassador, we have time for only a few more questions. Uh, one question, uh, another country which Poland watches as closely as Russia is Germany. Uh, of course, Germany had a very different stance towards energy dependence on Russia before the war than Poland did and a very different stance in terms of funding its military. It's since announced reversals on both those policies. There's considerable skepticism within the United States, as you probably know, about whether Germany will actually change its policy with regard to either energy, uh, reducing energy dependence on Russia or contributing more to its military. Are you among the skeptics? I have to be very diplomatic on that one. I understand. Uh, uh, Germany is our largest trading partner, an important ally in both the European Union and uh, NATO. Um, I used to joke that uh, this is probably the, the first period in our bilateral history that uh, most Poles wish Germany spent more on its military than less. Uh, because I would, I would personally prefer Germany to have our back. In a, in a hypothetical scenario of a major con conflagration in our uh, part of Europe. Uh, Germany became addicted to Russian gas after the Fukushima disaster, and after the German government's decision to phase out nuclear, which now seems to be a cardinal error committed, uh, well, many years ago. Uh, They're trying to shift to, uh, to green energy. Uh, but uh, it turns out now that uh, it was Poland and some other countries in Central, Central Europe, which were much more uh, pragmatic uh, in terms of uh, our collective energy security. We are, we are now, uh, as I said, uh, uh, for example, the discussion about 
the possibility of, of uh, blocking oil, gas, and uh, coal imports of Russia is of uh, paramount importance for Europe's uh, political future, but also for Europe's uh, energy security. I believe that uh, that paradigm shift that we saw a few weeks ago and which was expressed uh, a few times in uh, several uh, speeches uh, delivered by Chancellor Scholz will be uh, permanent. Um, on the other hand, we all know that uh, we are talking about a, a, a government coalition in which the, there are three partners, three parties, and it was very difficult to pursue a common agenda if you have a three-party coalition. So I, I think we will be uh, seeing even more turbulences in uh, German, uh, on the German political stage before uh, we will see um, a, a more solidified stance of the current German government and maybe of, of subsequent German governments in the future in terms of our collective energy security and in terms of our common uh, attitude towards Russia. Ambassador, last question. You were the public face of uh, extraordinarily unpopular Polish policies while serving as ambassador to Israel, uh, both as you started with regard to uh, statements about Polish complicity in the Holocaust, and then at the end uh, with of your term with regard to restitution. How did you feel on a personal level uh, as you, uh, defended these policies and faced an uproar from a pretty wide spectrum of Israeli society. A lot of coverage of those, uh, uh, of that legislation was biased, believe me, I'm, I'm saying this uh, sincerely. And uh, of course, I was trying to convince also the Israeli public opinion and Israeli audience that uh, maybe they should look at those uh, changes in the Polish legislation and uh, uh, the policies of the Polish government in a more nuanced way, in a more nuanced manner, because we all need perspective. And um, whenever I, because I spend a lot of time talking to young Israelis, to younger generations, uh, and um, whenever I talk to them about uh, our common history, I was trying to highlight uh, the sensitivities of both sides. And I was telling them, I perfectly understand your sensitivity. I perfectly understand your traumas, but please do understand ours. We also have our own sensitivities. We also have our very painful history. And I still believe that we have, uh, we can find common ground, talking about history, talking about our contemporary relations. On the final note, I will tell you another anecdote, which is a little bit more encouraging. Uh, whenever I talk to my Israeli friends in the 30s and 40s who uh, visited Poland, it was long before the pandemic, who visited Poland for the first time after the so-called, you know, I despise the term, but uh, please allow me to use it just once, the Holocaust trips. Uh, approximately 40,000 young Israelis were visiting Poland on an annual basis, visiting four or five concentration camps on four or five day trips. And they were returning to, to Israel uh, with that um, deeply embedded trauma and the association of Poland uh, as a huge graveyard. And it was one of my tasks, a tall order by the way, to explain to them that Poland is, doesn't need necessarily to be perceived only as a huge graveyard. And many of those, uh, people I spoke with about Poland and who, who, who had visited Poland, Warsaw or Krakow for the first time, they were telling me how shocked they were when they landed in Warsaw. They were saying, you know, I was expecting to see a gray, drab, uh, post-communist, cheap country. It was the main attraction, the cheapness of my country. Uh, uh, a gray country in the middle of nowhere in Central Europe. Uh, and then we landed in Warsaw and we, we saw something uh, different altogether. A vibrant, dynamic country, uh, 
advanced technologically, uh, so colorful, not only cheap, uh, and friendly. And that was one of the objectives, one of the descriptions I heard, I heard so frequently. Poland is so friendly uh, towards the Jews. And I, I, I do understand that for, for many in the American audience and the Israeli audience, uh, Poland depicted by Jews as a friendly country might uh, sound a little bit weird, but it is very friendly, it is secure, and it is so beautiful, and it is committed to preserving Jewish legacy on Polish soil. Ambassador Marek Majorowski, thank you so much for joining us.